we'll open our Bibles in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart desired and prayed to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Starts in my mind, <coughs> we'll kneel down for open prayer. I am merciful Father. We are thankful for this beautiful day that we could be here together. Lord, we are thankful for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Oh Lord, we are so weak. Please help us. Please lead us. Encourage us. Be with us. Lord, help that we give our hearts to you, that you could be in them, that you could lead us, and that we could do your will, not ours. Oh Lord, please be, the, be with our young people, with our children. You help them, encourage them, give them strength and wisdom. Oh Lord, please be with all of us, help us, that we can realize time when we live, that we realize how important it is that we have faith in you and that you are the only one who could help us and lead us. Please be with all of us, help us and bless us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear brothers and sisters, dear friends and visitors of children's young people meeting, young, young people, I'd like to welcome you all today for uh, this Sabbath. It's nice that we could be here together. It's nice that we could uh, study and learn something, that we could encourage each other, and that we could become better, better Christians. We have a few announcements for today. Uh, for divine service will be a special offering. Uh, this week, divine service offerings will be used to help fund a missionary school building in Mexico. So our divine offering will go for helping the missionary school, which they start building in uh, Mexico. After uh, divine service, we have fellowship lunch. Please join us. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we're going to visit uh, children's. We'll be singing at King Nursery Home at 3 p.m. this afternoon. Those participating should arrive by 2.45. So it's in the Bolton. And uh, for address or location, you could contact me or, or, or my wife, and we could, uh, we could uh, direct you. And uh, we're supposed to be there at 2.45. So our, our children's and young people meeting, they will, they will sing in old age home. Uh, this evening after Sabbath, uh, we should have a board meeting, but we still will confirm if we'll be or not, because some of our board members, they, they are not present, so we will still uh, de make decision if we'll be meeting or not. And we have our regular uh, prayer meeting at Tuesday at 7 p.m., so please be encouraged. To, to come when you can. And now we'll uh, invite ushers and we'll collect a special offering for a building school in the Mexico.
Thank you all. May God bless gifts and the givers. Now we'll invite our children and they have a special song for us. Thank you, children, for that uh, beautiful song, Seeking First, Kingdoms of the Lord, and everything else will add it. Uh, now we'll uh, go to our sermon, and we'll invite Brother Doreen, and he will uh, have a sermon. Uh, it's good to see all of you this morning, brethren, and uh, young children, and uh, all the youth, <clears throat> all of our dear visitors. In the name of Jesus, I would like us today to uh, uh, go to uh, the book of books, which is uh, the source of life and the eternal life. Uh, we, we will study today in uh, Romans chapter 10. Uh, this is part two, Jews, Gentiles, and the true seed of Abraham. And uh, we have one more, at least one more, in Romans 11. As I said last time, from Romans 9 to 11, this is a part in the book of Romans which Apostle Paul deals specifically with the Jews. He talks specifically about his people and his passion, and his heart goes out to his people, wherever they are, in Rome. In this particular case, they were in Rome. And in any other church in the Roman Empire. And up until today, Apostle Paul has something to say about his people. So, <clears throat> we will... Uh, uh, I'd like to ask... I'd like, you to, uh, I'd like to ask you to, uh, if you will, to open your Bibles to Romans 10, verse 1. And I'd like to encourage all of you, although this might be, uh, uh, if, if this will be on the screen, don't rely on what comes on video projector. I want you to bring your Bibles, okay? So this is very important when we study the Bible, that you bring your Bibles. So let us go to Romans chapter 10, and we will read verse 1. <clears throat> So, Apostle Paul, in continuation, in the same letter, this is the um, next chapter. Actually, when this epistle was written, there were no chapters and no verses, okay? So, but in continuation of his letter, Apostle Paul says, Brethren, 
my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. This is our key verse today. And I, I'd like you to notice something when he starts talking here, how he calls them, brethren. So, and this is very, uh, this is very uh, special for us as well, because in the church, in the church of God, we call ourselves uh, brothers and sisters, right? <clears throat> it was the same practice in the New Testament church. In, uh, in, this, uh, in this case, Paul is addressing with brethren. So what's his heart's desire, Paul says here? And his prayer to God for Israel is that they might, what? Be saved. Nothing else. Paul doesn't say that I want them to be, you know, the uh, top of the most brilliant minds and that they would be the richest people. No, Apostle Paul says one thing. I want that my people, that Israel would what? Would be saved. This is his desire. In, uh, <clears throat> in verse 2 and verse 3, same Apostle Paul says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. <laughs> For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So Paul, Paul talks about some kind of zeal, but not according to knowledge. I'd like to read one paragraph. <clears throat> this is from a commentary from uh, Wagner on Romans. It's page 162. And this is how Wagner noticed it. What does it mean to have zeal, but not according to knowledge? Do you sometimes have zeal for something? And we are on fire when we say, well, I really want to do this thing. But then... The Lord comes and says, well, this is not according to knowledge. And in the same character of Apostle Paul, you will see that he had one day, he had so much zeal that he was killing so many Christians. Did he have zeal? Yes. Very much zeal. Okay, let's read what <clears throat> Wagner says here in, in, in his book. It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Zeal is very necessary to the accomplishment of anything. But zeal without knowledge is like a wild horse without a bit or bridle. There is plenty of activity, but it is of no use. Or it is like the man who displays great zeal and earnestness in reaching a certain place, but who is traveling in the wrong direction. No matter how zealous a man may be, he will never reach a place that is north of him by traveling southward. Ignorance nullifies zeal. And Hosea 4, 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of what? Of zeal? No, for lack of knowledge. The people of Israel, even in the first century, <clears throat> they, have, they had lots of zeal. They were on fire, as we say, you know, for the Lord, in a way, you know, <coughs> excuse me, imposing their rituals and feasts and circumcision and many other things I can mention in the same list. But what did Apostle Paul say? He said, they are trying to reach this salvation by their own righteousness. And that was impossible. They try to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. <laughs> Apostle Paul, in, uh, we read in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 9 to 11, Paul says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. <laughs> and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off 
often in every synagogue and compelled them to <coughs> blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. <laughs> One day when he was converted, he was traveling with letters from Jerusalem. He was going where? Anyone wants to help me? To Damascus. And what is the purpose? Did he go on vacation <coughs> of his visit to Damascus? Did he go to visit the library in Damascus? No. The purpose was to go and lay hands, uh, not lay yes, to, to, to uh, capture, to, uh, to take those Christians in Damascus and imprison them or even put them to death. Very, very uh, much zeal there. You can see it, right? He was very zealous, but not according to knowledge. And now he's addressing to his own people, and he says the same. You might have this zeal, you might impose circumcision, you might say that you should do this and that, but this doesn't have anything to do with the religion of Christ. <clears throat> Brethren, you know, this is very disappointing, because sometimes, or many times, you, you find yourself that you have been going to church, that you have been doing this thing, and you have been doing many things, and at one point you realize that in, in certain instances you were wrong. And you come to and it's good if you come to this understanding and to this realization. And you say, How can I? But you know, this is such a disappointment sometimes because for so many years <clears throat> you have been doing it. And now for the people of Israel it was a big disappointment. When Paul comes and tells them this, uh, these things. We read in verse 4, Romans 10, verse 4. Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. <clears throat> some, uh, uh, some people, uh, Christian people, so-called Christian people, they like this verse. And not just this particular one, but especially in the book of Romans, you know, it says that Christ is the end of the law. And here in verse 4 he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. They take it as a torch, and they go out there, and they start preaching. They say, this is the new gospel of Jesus Christ. They, they call themselves Christians of the New Testament Christians. There are believers of the Old Testament, and these are believers of the New Testament. I don't know where they got that idea, but it's definitely not from the Bible. And I would like to uh, share with you why this is not biblical. <clears throat> in the book Exploring Romans, page 210, uh, the commentator says, these verses prove to be a controversial one in Christianity understanding. <laughs> what is it that Romans 10.4 is teaching? Before beginning, we should note that whereas nearly all English translators render the verses Christ is the end of the law. I have translated that phrase as culmination of the law. Good reasons support that rendering. For one thing, even though <clears throat> telos can mean end, that translation has too often led to a misunderstanding related to the idea of the abolition of God's law and that Christians are now free to do as they please. Such an interpretation directly contradicts such passages as Romans 3, 31, 7, 12, and other um, parts of the Bible. For Paul, faith establishes the law which is holy, just, and good. What that interpretation is certainly true, it does not capture the full meaning of Romans 10, 4. The word tells us not only means end in the sense of termination, but also goal, or outcome. Thus notes F.F. F. Bruce, Christ is the goal at which the law aimed in that he embodies the perfect righteousness which, is which it prescribes. <clears throat> so when Paul goes in verse 4 here and it says that Christ is what? Is the end of the law for righteousness. In other verse, he says, I came to fulfill. I did not come to destroy, but I came what? To fulfill the law. 
So can he, can he abolish something what he came to fulfill? No way. So the idea of the Old Testament believers and the idea of the New Testament believers, it's not biblical. And I'd like to explain you why this is what Paul was, uh, was preaching in his letter, was, was writing in his letter. In, uh, in this respect, I'd like you to go because many people come and they say, uh, look, in, in the Old Testament, you've got the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, right? In the New Testament, we've got just two laws, two commandments. Which are those two laws? Love your God with your own heart and love your neighbor, right? This is, this is what people preach and they say, this is the New Testament religion. This is the new gospel. Now, I'd like you to show... Uh, this is um, uh, first in, in Matthew 5.17, Christ says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. That's what Christ says. <coughs> and in Matthew 22, come with me if you will, Matthew 22, verse 36 to verse 40. So, if you are paying attention, you are going to discover something very interesting. Now, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. One day, one, of the, one man came to Jesus and he asked him a question. Verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The so-called New Testament believers, they take the same Bible and they come to you and they come to me and they say, See, there is not any more Ten Commandments. Christ gave us something new. Two laws, two commandments. Love your God and love your neighbor. Now, if this is the case, I'd like to turn the Bible in the, in the Old Testament and let us take a look if what Christ was saying was something new or this was something from the Old Testament. Now, come with me, if you will, to De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is in Torah, the fifth book, book of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. <laughs> and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Was this something new, or this was something from Torah? When Christ answered his answer, he was quoting Torah. He didn't bring anything new. The same law was in Torah before. And you might say, well, this is just one part, but brother, how about the second part? Well, now come with me, if you will, to Leviticus. Chapter 19, verse 18. This is also in Torah. Leviticus 19, verse 18. The Bible says, Also thou shalt not approach unto a... Um, excuse me. 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So the second commandment which Christ mentioned in Matthew 22, thy shall love your neighbor as thyself, is mentioned where? In Torah. We just read in Leviticus, right? The Bible says you should not avenge yourself, but you shall love. So when Christ brought these two commandments and he says in these two <coughs> Excuse me. The entire law is, is in these two commandments. This is, not, this is not, nothing new. 
They knew about it. And if you want a proof about that, also in the, the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, now notice this, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 28. Now a lawyer comes to Jesus, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up <coughs> and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Actually, he said, What is written in Torah? That was the law, in Torah. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now, can you see it here? The lawyer, because he was, he was the lawyer, he, he knew the law, he is quoting from where? From Torah. So to love your God and to love your neighbor, this is not, this is not something new. Absolutely not. And, uh, and uh, we, we have to be clear and we have to understand because when we talk about Jews and Gentiles and, and uh, the seed of Abraham, this should, uh, be, this should be clear in our minds what Paul wanted to, uh, to teach them and what he wanted them to, uh, uh, to, uh, to understand. We go back to Romans in continuation, chapter 10. <laughs> Verse 5 and onward. For Moses describing the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness, righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. <laughs> Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. And in, in by heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scriptures say, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So Paul is making this transition here in chapter 10. We'll see. <clears throat> he first describes his desire. His heart desire is that they, his people, Israel, might be saved. Now, brethren, in this sermon, in, in the next one, which is part 3, we, we will talk specific, specifically about Israel and how they can be saved. And if there is hope for them, did God abandon them? And we have our part to, uh, uh, to play in this whole equation when it comes to the Gentiles as well. You, you will see how we are called in the same epistle of Paul to Romans. From verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report. Um, in these verses, we see that Paul uh, goes to the second part, and he says, how they shall believe if they never heard. So he opens the, the book now, and he says, well... He talks about the missionary work. He talks about the uh, evangelism. The big problem today 
is not that there are no books or Bibles. I, um, <clears throat> I was shocked by, by this gentleman when he, um, when he made a few statements. His name is Stuart Briscoe, and he, off he offers an answer to, to this problem. He says, talking about the lost of the world, he says, the unreached populations of the world are a scandal to the name of Christ and his church. The problem is not that we are here and they are there. <laughs> the problem is that after 2,000 years, so many people still, still have never heard the gospel message. The scandal is that 2,000 years after he left, 100,000 people around the world will die today, most of whom will have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. This is a true tragedy, and it is also a scandal and a rebuke to the Christian church. Very serious business. <clears throat> Cameron Townsend, uh, he was a missionary to Guatemala, and when he was preaching to those people, you know, to the local Indians in Guatemala, um, they spoke a little Spanish, but they had their own language. And then uh, one day, uh, Townsend gave them an Indi Indi uh, to an Indian a Spanish Bible. But that, that man, he couldn't read. And he asked him one question. He said, if your God is so great, he asked, why can't he speak my language? You know, from this question, it was born the idea, not just the idea. It was, uh, uh, this was the foundation of the um, Wycliffe Bible translators, and they started to translate. But just from that question, he said, if your God is so great, why can't he speak my language? And Paul here in Romans, he says, how they can know it if nobody is preaching to them? Do we, need to, uh, uh, do we need to approach the Jews? Do we need to work for them? Absolutely. There is a special, uh, there is a special part in uh, the inspiration what Sister White talks, and she says that a special part in the last days will be offered to the Jews. In verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and safe. I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. A special work and a special <clears throat> burden was for Apostle Paul that his people might be saved. And he was not joking. He was very serious and he had a real passion. Wherever he went, if you notice what the Bible says, he went first to his people, to a synagogue where usually Jews would go in the first century, right? And he would do what? He would present the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his mission. And that's what he is encouraging. He, that, that's what he is saying here for us today, that we would do the same. Now, I'd like to talk finally, this message will be short, but I'd like to talk finally about <clears throat> there are missions and there are ministries here in North America. They say, well, we should go to Israel and we should build again. We should go and build the temple. We should go and uh, uh, we are for Israel. And surprisingly, that these are not Jews. 
You know who are these? These are Gentiles. These are people like you and me. They are not Jews. And they say, well, we are for Israel. Let's build the temple. Let's do. What's interesting? Up until today, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, you, you have to know this. Uh, up until today, uh, the temple is gone and nobody rebuilt it. But for us to understand the, the, the background and why, why is like that, we, we have to look at the uh, nation of Israel. You know that a little bit more than 50 years ago, they were not as a nation. Then when they, uh, they were organized as a, uh, you know, as a state, uh, it was last century, right? So it's, it's not so long ago. But what is important about Israel, you have to know that Israel doesn't have a constitution. And you know why? The state of Israel doesn't have a constitution, like you say, the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of Canada or the Chart of Rights, right? No, there is not such a thing in Israel. <clears throat> you know what's the constitution of the state of Israel? Torah. <laughs> and this is quite interesting. From the beginning, last time we, we talked about Abraham. In, in this sermon, we talk about Jews, Gentiles. And the true seed of Abraham. From Abraham, God had a plan for these people. And then this nation evolved. And then came Moses, generations after. And you know what Moses did? Moses was killing himself. And you might help me, how was he doing that? Traveling from Egypt with a people numbering over probably with children, around 2 million people. You know what he was doing when he approached his father-in-law? And his father-in-law, well, you might say he was a pagan. No, he was serving the Lord because he was still, he was not an Israelite, but he was a Hebrew from Abraham as well. If you read the Bible, you'll notice that, okay? So that intelligent man, he came to Moses, and what did he say? You're killing yourself. And he said, why? What are you doing? He said, well, people have troubles, and they come to me, and I have to communicate, because Moses was a prophet. So what advice his father-in-law gave to Moses? He said, you have to take from this burden, you have to divide. Actually, it's very interesting that before Sinai, the... The, the, the nation was already organized. Before the law was given, the Ten Commandments, he already organized, you know, over 50, over 100, over 1,000, over 10,000. So now people would come to those still uh, honest, uh, trustworthy people, and then the, 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 the hardest problem or issue would be brought up to Moses. Otherwise, he would would deal with everything, and he was just one person. <clears throat> so very interesting that Israel, this is also important when people come to us and they say, well, why you do not go to war and why you do not fight? See, the people of Israel, and they, they bring the example of uh, Joshua, they bring, bring the example of David and uh, other kings and judges, they were involved in different fights and, and battles. You know why? Because Israel was a theocracy. You know what is theocracy? I'll explain very simple. Theology comes from theos, which means God. Theology, that's people say, I study theology. Theocracy means also that God is on top. He communicates with his prophet, and then the prophet communicates with the people. That's why in the Old Testament we have those words because they were under the rulership of God. God allowed it to happen. Nowadays, there is no theocracy. I'd like you to show me where is a theocracy. There is no theocracy anymore. We talk about democracy, but not theocracy. 
So in order to understand what Paul wanted to say and how his people might be saved, this is very interesting. And unfortunately, many people are missing the point. So Israel was organized as a theocracy. Now in our days, when some Christians, they come and they say, we have to go and build the temple. Now, if you, if you want, I, I want to share with you, there are three reasons why the temple can be rebuilt. Number one, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> number one, you know that when Ben-Gurion, over 50 years ago, when they took over, you know, the, the city, part of it, and he was ready, he said, he went to the rabbi, the chief, and he said, do you want us to take over that part? You know that on the temple hill, there are two things, actually three, which do not belong to Israel. There is a mosque, and there is a cemetery. So when he asked the, 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 the rabbi, he said, no way. They had the power. Why they didn't take it over? There are a few things, and this is quite interesting. The mosque is number one, where the temple stood, the temple of Solomon, and the, the second one. Number two, there is a cemetery. And you know, when you touch a dead person, you can't go and touch the holy things. So the, 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 the thing number one, why the temple can't be rebuilt, because how you can take that cemetery out without having the temple to go and to, uh, uh, to, to bring a sacrifice. This is a paradoxal, but it's true. Now, in order to do that, you need the Messiah, but you do not accept the Messiah. Well, they, still, they are still waiting for the Messiah. So the mosque and the cemetery, this is number, uh, number one. Number two, in the Old Testament, it says there was a red calf. Nobody knows today exactly what was that, you know, which, which kind. And number three is that you need, uh, you need a high priest from the tribe of, tribe of Levi. And you know that <clears throat> the tribe of Judah, the Jews of today, you have still them around. But I'd like you to go and show me where there is one from Dan or Naphtali or Simeon or any other uh, tribes. They have lost in the history. So you have these three big problems. But the good news, brethren, the good news for the people of Israel, even today, I don't want to ask why I brought this to your attention. Because usually we talk history, what happened during the Apostle Paul. But how we can approach them now? You know, the biggest problem for the Jews today, you know what's the problem? Because they don't have the temple where to bring the sacrifices. Now, how you are going to do the remission of sins? This is a very serious question. If you don't have the temple, you can't bring the sacrifice. How do they ask for forgiveness then? In our days, I'm talking about our days. Well, some ultra-Orthodox Jews, what they do, there is a practice. There is a practice. And um, <clears throat> this is called, if I can find it, this is called taslich. In Hebrew, what they do, especially for Yom Kippur, what they do, they symbolically, they take their sins, they take a loaf of bread, and they put it on the water. So that way, they believe that sins are going to be washed away, and they are now clean. I heard something else, that in New York City, some Orthodox Jews, again, for Yom Kippur, you know, Yom Kippur, the day of... Uh, uh, atonement, what they would do, you know, the, the father, the, 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 the one who is in charge, because they don't have where to bring the, bring the sacrifice. So what they would do, they would take a chicken and round about their heads and say a prayer and say, well, this, my sins and the sins of my wife and my children, let them be forgiven. <laughs> Brother, the good news is, you don't need a chicken. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who is our high priest in heaven. 
And this is the good news when, when Apostle Paul comes and he says, they wanted to establish something on their own righteousness. But we need the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the good news for today. <clears throat> when I say these practices, these are not done by all the Jews. These are just some Orthodox Jews, you know, who, who really uh, believe in that. But we have to understand and we have to bring the good news and the message to all of those people. Because Apostle Paul said here that my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And my prayer today for all of us, although we are not from the Jews, but we, we should have the same passion and the same heart that they might be saved. You know, one, one Jew, he said, if you, if you win a Jew for Christ, you own a missionary. So may the Lord help us that we would be true disciples of Jesus and we would reflect and show everybody and especially to the people of Israel uh, the true meaning and that our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, is waiting for all of us and for, for the people of Israel as well. Amen. Thank you, Brother Doreen. I will go now to our closing hymn, hymn number 425. I will sing of Jesus' love. Please rise.
kneel down for closing prayer and Brother Doreen will pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we uh, bow down in your presence and holiness. We ask you to uh, uh, be merciful unto us and forgive our sins and shortcomings. We ask you, dear Lord, to uh, guide our minds and uh, put in us that thought of eternity and uh, that you might give us the Holy Spirit to guide us in all the truth and that we, uh, we might understand and comprehend it. We ask you to be, be with all your people today, and I'm asking for the young people, for children, uh, for all of those who are uh, in disappointment or uh, discouraged. Lord, be with everyone and uh, touch their hearts, and touch our hearts as well, that we might uh, feel your presence, and that we might live from this place with the assurance that in your name, and in your uh, power, we, we are saved. Lord, we ask you to abide with us uh, during this Sabbath day. And I'm asking as well for the children's program in the retirement home. Please uh, prepare the way and bless those people who are going to be blessed by their singing. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. We came to the end of our divine service. Uh, we'll go downstairs and have fellowship lunch. And remember who is going to old age home, we should leave around 2.15, but really leave 2.15, not start getting organized. We should leave around 2.15. Now we are dismissed. Mm -hmm.